Um, thank you all for joining us here today. My name is Olivia and I'll be discussing some work that I've done as part of my master's degree. The project was supervised by Andrew Chin, Michael Grant and Cassidy Rigby, and it focuses on the global conservation status threats and management of hammerhead sharks. So the uh, life history of sharks and rays are characterized by slow growth rates, late maturation rates, and low fecundity. Despite these traits having led to evolutionary success, they also translate to high vulnerability to anthropogenic pressures. Such pressures have led to extensive declines in recent history, with around a third of shark and ray species now threatened with extinction. As highlighted in Dolby et al's 2021 study, overfishing is one of the most prominent, threat, um, prominent driving forces behind these declines, with 100% of species imperiled by exploitation. This is primarily through capture as bycatch in high value fisheries, or through targeted fishing for shark products such as fins, meat, and liver oil. With their laterally elongated head, hammerhead sharks are amongst the most unique shark and ray species. Unfortunately, like most shark species, they face a precarious future with all nine species currently threatened with extinction. This is largely driven by intense and unmanaged fishing pressure across their range. Their elongated head leads to frequent capture as bycatch and net-based fisheries, and despite not being considered a target species, uh, their large fin size with high needle count incentivizes their retention around the world. And these qualities fetch uh, prices of between 100 to 120 US dollars per kilogram of unprocessed fins. So concerns over the status of the three larger bodied species led to their listing on uh, CITES Appendix 2 in 2014. And this means countries are required to produce a non-detriment finding in order to participate in the international trade of these species. The proposal to be considered at this year's COP event is the inclusion of the bonnethead shark on Appendix 2. The proposal also stipulates the inclusion of all remaining species within the Serenidae family, including those yet to be identified. Uh, my talk today will provide an overview of a body of work that I completed as part of my master's, and the results that which came out of this project, project will be useful to inform this year's listing. <clears throat> So with ongoing population declines, we identified a need to improve our understanding of where hammerhead sharks are positioned in the broader narrative of global shark declines. When considering the recent reviews on species groups such as the rhino rays and the wedge, uh, sawfishes, the overarching picture is particularly concerning. In light of this, this study aimed to address this knowledge gap by providing a global overview of the hammerhead shark family. So all nine species were considered um, in this review as shown here on the slide. The conservation status and distribution for these species was obtained from the IUCN Red List of Threatened Species, and their distribution maps were uploaded into ArcGIS in order to create a map of global species richness. In the case of the data deficient Carolina hammerhead, distribution was obtained from the Ebert et al. 2021 Sharks of the World book. To inform exploitation, uses and trade, we collected landings and trade data from two fisheries databases, the Food and Agriculture Organization and Sea Around Us, and trade data was obtained from the CITES trade database. FAO landings from 2000 to 2020 were obtained from the FAO Global Fishery and Aquaculture Production Statistics, and then uploaded onto FishStatJ. Reconstructed catch data from 2000 to 2018 were obtained from uh, Sea Around Us's database. And the CITES trade database was used to ascertain the country's frequently reporting imports and exports of hammerhead shark products, as well as the exact purpose of this trade, i.e. was it commercial or non-commercial. So to determine existing legislation pertaining to hammerhead sharks, we conducted a search at the international and regional level. Given the sheer volume and com complexity of in-country legislation, compiling national policy was considered outside the scope of this review. For international policy, CITES and CMS databases were used, including CMS MOU, and all parties to either CITES and or CMS were recorded, as well as any publicly available non-detriment findings. Uh, to determine existing regional legislations, large tropical fisheries management organizations were used. Um, conservation and management measures pertaining to retention were noted, as well as any catch reporting requirements. Where hammerhead shark specific measures did not exist, measures which applied more generally to sharks were noted down. 
So the life history and ecology is most well described for the three larger bodied species of hammerhead and the bonnethead shark. With the exception of the bonnethead, hammerheads exhibit slow growth, a late onset of maturity and low productivity. And as seen elsewhere in sharks and rays, these characteristics translate to low recovery potential and a poor resilience to fishing pressure. In contrast, the bonnethead is smaller, matures earlier and is relatively short lived. And for this reason, it is considered as having one of the highest rebound potentials of all sharks. Whilst this confers some resistance to fishing pressure, uh, the bonnethead shark has declined throughout its range, indicating that it is still highly vulnerable. So according to the IUCN Red List, five out of nine of the species of hammerhead shark are listed as critically endangered, meaning they've undergone a decline of over 80% over the last three generations. Uh, two species are listed as endangered, having undergone a decline of uh, 50 to 79%. And the smooth hammerhead is the least threatened species having undergone a decline of between 30 to 49%. Due to its relatively recent discovery, the Carolina hammerhead is listed as data deficient. So with respect to distribution, the larger bodied uh, species of hammerhead are found globally, and the remaining smaller bodied species demonstrate more localized distributions restricted to shallow coastal waters. Uh, given their propensity to these waters, the impacts of fishing on hammerheads are compounded by a lack of refuge at depth. And as fishing effort is typically highest in coastal environments, these species are susceptible to capture throughout their lifetime. This is particularly problematic for those species confined to Central and South America, where coastal fishing is intense. So in producing a global map of species richness, a number of interesting stories began to emerge. As I've highlighted here on this figure, there is an intersection between species richness and those regions subject to intense and unmanaged fishing pressure. For example, you have up to six species occurring along the coast of Brazil, a country listed in the top 20 hammerhead shark fishing nations. Across these nations, fishing pressure is largely driven by the demand for shark products. In Central and South America, this demand is focused towards meat, whereas in Central, uh, sorry, in Asia, the demand for shark fin is a persisting issue. Um, it's likely that the intersection between species richness and the threat of fishing is the primary driving force behind observed declines. So hammerhead sharks are captured in a um, commercial and small scale fisheries using a wide range of gears. Fishing pressure is driven by the demand for hammerhead shark fins, which are highly valued on the international fin trade. The emerging demand for shark meat is also driving fishing pressure. Shark meat is consumed extensively across Central and South America, particularly in Brazil, where there's considerable demand. And genetic evidence from market surveys indicates that catches are not limited to the three larger bodied species, which therefore reiterates the importance of this year's listing proposal. The impacts of fishing are compounded by their exceptionally at high uh, at vessel and post release mortality rates. For species such as the great hammerhead and scalloped hammerhead, at vessel mortality rates can be as high as 97.6%. Due to the morphological similarities uh, exhibited across the hammerhead family, they're frequently subjected to misidentification. And because of this, catches are rarely recorded to the species level. Instead, generic names <clears throat> are typically implied, and this significantly impedes understanding of species specific landings and trade. So using landings data from the FAO and sea around us, we determined the top 10 hammerhead shark fishing nations. Based on the total landings weight reported to FAO between 2000 and 2020, uh, the majority of hammerhead sharks are being landed across West Africa, Southeast Asia, and Central America. There appears to be three key countries where the weight of landed sharks exceeds 15,000 tons, and these being Indonesia, Mexico, and Senegal. Um, there are discrepancies between the countries which have reported landings of CITES listed species to the FAO and those actually reporting to CITES as, rep um, as represented by their um, representation in the countries in the trade database. Reasons for this mismatch could include the domestic consumption of products, stockpiling or trading products which were obtained prior to their listing in 2014, and where these reasons don't apply, um, it possibly indicates that these species are being traded in contravention to CITES obligations. So when breaking down the FAO top uh, hammerhead shark fishing nations into a time series, you can begin to see how the key players change over time. For example, landings in Indonesia have largely decreased over the last 10 years, whereas uh, in Mozambique, you can begin to see it emerging as a key fishing nation. 
So interestingly, there are differences in the top 10 hammerhead shark fishing nations produced from the FAO and sea around us. For example, according to the FAO, Senegal is positioned as the third highest with over 19,000 tons of hammerheads landed between 2000 and 2020. In contrast, reconstructed catch data estimates Senegal's landings to be over 200,000 tons. In addition to the difficulties associated with using reconstructed data, this could be due to the lack of management capacity across developing nations where the threat of fishing is most intense, and also the lack of species specific reporting in the shark trade. Another interesting difference is the inclusion of Panama in the sea around us top 10, which could be explained by flags of convenience. As a flag of convenience, there are over 8,000 vessels um, registered under the Panamanian flag. And as Panama is yet to report landings of hammerheads to the FAO, it's plausible that these vessels are responsible for the estimates provided by sea around us. Another interesting difference um, for reasons to us, which is currently unknown, is the absence of Indonesia in sea around us top 10. So here you can see the countries which are most frequently reporting exports and imports of hammerhead shark products. According to these data, 48% uh, of all products are traded for commercial purposes. Hong Kong is one of the lead importers and USA the lead exporter. Based on the uh, purposes reported to CITES, 94% of hammerhead shark products into Hong Kong are listed as commercial. And in contrast, a mere 8% of USA's exports are described as commercial, with the remaining listed under circus or traveling exhibition. So international conservation policies concern the three larger bodied species of hammerhead only. At the bottom of the slide, you can see the proportion of countries across these species ranges, which are signatories to CITES and CMS. So for example, with the scalloped hammerhead, 85% of the countries found within its range are CITES, uh, signatories to CITES and 53% to CMS. There is great potential for these bodies to act as a driver for top-down conservation efforts and also to provide a platform to raise growing conservation issues within hammerhead sharks. So whilst there's significant potential for these bodies to drive the uh, conservation of threatened shark species, it's also important to note that there are several issues associated with their implementation. For example, in in regards to CMS MOU, there's a real lack of participation from countries which play a large role in global shark and ray landings, including China, Taiwan, and Indonesia. With respect to CITES, it's important to note that listings only address threats pertaining to international trade and therefore do not prevent mortality and can only be considered a holistic approach to conservation when used in conjunction with other measures. There's also a concerning lack of publicly available NDFs, despite the three listed species having global distributions. Obviously, a caveat to this is that it is not mandatory to make an NDF publicly available. So of the 17 RFMOs covering the world's oceans, five were identified as frequently interacting with hammerhead sharks. Only three of these RFMOs have management measures um, concerning hammerhead sharks, and the specificity of these is variable based on region. For example, GFCM has regulations which concern just the smooth and great hammerhead, whereas those implemented by the ICCAT concern the entire Sphrenidae family. Given the high at vessel and post release mortality rates of hammerhead sharks, the extent to which catch bans can contribute to their conservation is highly contentious. It's therefore unlikely that bans and retentions will be entirely effective for these species. <clears throat> So at present, there is informa insufficient information to inform the global conservation outlook for the hammerhead shark family. And this is largely due to the ambiguities reported across the major fisheries databases. The information that is available suggests that hammerhead sharks are in significant trouble. And if appropriate action is not taken, the risk of localized extinctions will become increasingly high. To allow for the necessary recovery of this family, we must focus on improving the resolution of fisheries data and also quantifying the take from the small scale sector. This could include the use um, of things such as um, ID guide development, which can equip fishers to more accurately identify species and also regular market surveys within small scale fishing communities. Given the lack of literature relating to the social aspects of hammerhead shark conservation, greater effort must be paid towards understanding the social implications of management. And this is particularly important for the implementation of bottom-up management measures. We identify an opportunity for global bodies such as CITES to better assist with current management efforts. This will likely be achieved by this year's proposed listing. And these listings will be a sensible step towards improving the transparency of trade of threatened shark species. 
For developing nations, this listing will require a commitment to ongoing capacity building initiatives from the broader international community. With respect to the role of RFMOs, there needs to be a consideration for more stringent uh, fisheries management measures, uh, together with um, research centered around mitigating hammerhead shark interactions. And this is particularly important given the high post-release mortality rates observed across the family. As mentioned earlier, this year's listing proposal will expand the listing from the three larger bodied species to the entire Sphrenidae family, including those species yet to be identified. This is supported by extensive population declines observed across the family, the identification of all nine species within the international fin trade, and their consideration as lookalikes when, when traded in their most common form, this being dried, unprocessed fin. This listing is likely to implicate uh, fisheries in Australia and Papua New Guinea, which regularly catch winghead sharks. For example, a recent report by Piku Biodiversity Network um, identified wingheads comprising up to 80% of small scale fish and catch in Southern Papua New Guinea, a region where fins are retained from shark and ray catches. We don't know whether these populations are discrete. So this means that these catches might be impacting those fisheries in Australia and will therefore need to be considered by fisheries managers. It appears that there is wide support from, for the listing proposal from global bodies such as FAO and IECN. FEO's expert advisory panel notes that whilst the fin trade may not be a significant driver in the exploitation of the bonnethead shark, it does consider it to meet the uh, criteria for listing on CITES Appendix 2. They also note that due to the challenges in distinguishing parts of hammerheads, the entire Sphrenidae family should also be included on Appendix 2. Overall, the expert panel is in, in agreement that the listing will help solve lookalike issues across the taxa. With respect to ICN and traffic, the listing proposal has been accepted. Whilst they do not agree that the declines of the bonnethead shark are consistent for inclusion on Appendix 2, um, they note that regulation of international trade is needed for the complex. They agree that all species in the Sphrenidae family meet the criteria for inclusion on CITES Appendix 2. And I just want to finish off by thanking my supervisors and the IECN Shark Specialist Group in supporting the writing of this review, and also to Lawrence and HSI for organizing today's event. Thank you very much.